Hey family, this is David Mahan, and uh, there's going to be some sensitive content being shared in this particular podcast, so uh, definitely not appropriate for children. Just wanted to give you that, that heads up. You know, the opposition to what's happening to kids here, you know, in my case, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a religious conservative, you know, uh, I'm a political conservative, but it's a hands across the aisle deal. I mean, it is people of all political parties. It, it, you know, it, it, it's conservative, it's liberal, it's religious, it's not religious. Uh, we, we even have, uh, you know, no kidding, um, you know, gay group, gay identified groups, and one trans identified adult group who work with us because they all agree. No, draw the line at kids. There's nothing in this that should be, you know, That's something right. that you approach kids with. So it's not, you know, just the, the radical right, you know, as they want to see on the other side. It's an all hands on deck because of how serious this is. And welcome back to The Narrative. This is Center for Christian Virtue President Aaron Baer here with my co-host and friend David Mahan, our policy director here at CCV. We're keeping rolling with our series on woke capitalism, this, this whole volume on woke capitalism, looking at what's happening uh, in the marketplace today. Uh, and uh, how, how much it's shifted radically uh, over the last few years. And uh, folks that used to be, uh, you know, business friends, the, the fiscal conservatives that used to generally be aligned with a lot of social conservatives, if you will, um, how they've changed their positions and now have become real uh, opponents um, or at least roadblocks to any effort to protect children, to protect family. Uh, and we're, we're unpacking that from all, all the different aspects to understand how this happened uh, and what we need to do to, you know, a lot of times we'll talk about this and how do we get corporate America back to neutral. Um, today, we're going to actually be talking with a, a really special guest, uh, Dr. Andre Van Mole. Um, Dr. Van Mole is, is someone we've flown out to Ohio before to, to speak uh, on CCV supported bills, in particular, um, our SAFE Act, our, our, our bill to prohibit um, chemical and surgical castration of children for the purpose of uh, gender transition. And you might be asking, why are we bringing a doc in? Well, you know, really, um, the industry that has might maybe been affected the most uh, by this woke capitalism mindset is the medical industry, um, where you see, and, and it's probably the, the starkest, um, where you see uh, these these hospitals and pharmaceutical companies uh, putting uh, politics in above of profits, um, and uh, putting not just politics above of profits, but politics above of. Uh, their their requirements to care for their patients and doing what's best for their patients yeah, in particular. doing no harm <laughs> exactly doing no harm um, and it, it really shows the ideological nature of this because there's there's some things that we see Dave where uh, you know you see businesses doing things like supporting the Equality Act um, which is very clearly bad for business it's it, it opens up all these new avenues for you to be sued and that's that's one of the these things about woke capitalism that is just blows your mind is that they they they're actually businesses are actually working against their own interests but when you get into the medical space and you see hospitals actually working against uh you know working against their 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 oaths their the working against science uh, and doing things that undermine uh the very nature of treating patients um uh, it, it's just it it blows my mind you know you know, one of the, the things that was interesting about the hearing that Dr. Van Mole um, came and testified for was that there was somebody actually on the committee that was that was a part of, of Children's Hospital. And, and, you know, without going into all of the details, I was she was more concerned with discrediting all of our experts and parents than answering the very important questions. If, if, if the answers that we're bringing are false, well then you, you think she'd spend most of her time giving all the reasons for why they're false, but uh, she didn't spend a lot of time on that. Um, she just wanted to discredit. And, and I thought that was very telling. We'll yeah, talk again, to about that. Right, yeah, and again, it, it just shows more of how politics has, has corrupted all of these different areas of society. And, and this is a conversation we're, we're really looking forward to. So, so don't go anywhere for that one. Uh, but before we do uh, get there, we want to just talk about some of the news today. And, and really, there, there's one major thing uh, that I, I want to talk about today. Uh, and uh, I, I told Dave, uh, while we were prepping, I said, Dave, you you're just gonna have to, to push in on this one, because I'm, I'm, I don't want to say I'm more ticked off about this one than normal um, because there's a lot of things that, that happen uh, that are just that blow your mind. Um, but th this is one that I think a lot of folks just don't understand why we care so much. 
Uh, and I think it's something that really deserves some some airspace to to work through. And it, it's it's what the U.S. House. So as we're recording this, um, the U.S. House uh, voted last night uh, to uh, to basically redefine marriage nationwide. To, to respect to, for marriage act. It, yeah, it's called the Respect for Marriage Act. Uh, Forty seven Republicans went along with all the Democrats to to vote for this. Four Ohio Republicans in particular. Um, and, uh, and, you know, again, it, it re- both repeals the federal defense of marriage act that was passed in the late nineties with bipartisan support signed by, Bill you know, Clinton. that, that, you know, that seething red meat conservative Bill Clinton. Um, and it, it both repeals that and then makes a federal same sex marriage mandate. And, uh, and now it's, it's gone over to the Senate. Um, and you know, they got to get to 60 votes in the Senate. That's typically where most of these liberal ideas have died, but there's real risk that this could pass. I mean, already, um, Ohio Senator, uh, Republican Senator Rob Portman has come out not, and not just that he's going to support the bill, but he's actually a co-sponsor of it now. Um, and you know, it's, it's one of these things that I'm sure for a lot of folks are listening. Well, listen, we already have a Burgerfell. What's the big deal? Um, you know, the, it, it's not like a Burgerfell was going to get turned over anytime soon. You know, same sex marriage is already the law of the land. Why, why would we even bother fighting this? Um, and there's, there's a lot here to talk about. I, I, I want to kind of work it through systematically. Um, you know, the, the first thing I want to just jump on with this is, you know, when, when same-sex marriage was, wait, wait, let, let's even just go back, you know, 2004 CCV led the marriage amendment campaign in Ohio. Um, this is when mo- a lot of states were doing this. Uh, it was an incredibly successful political campaign. 62% of Ohioans uh, voted for marriage between a man and a woman. Um, you know, and by the time the Obergefell decision came around, there was over 30 states that had passed similar constitutional amendments. So the majority of states, our state constitutions say, Marriage is the union of one man and one woman. Now, you know, fast forward a few years to around 2011, 2012, when Rob Portman comes out um, in support of same-sex marriage. He flipped his position. It was national news, first major Republican to do this. He did so because, uh, according to to what he he said, he changed his position because uh, his son is gay, uh, and that's what changed his mind on it. Um, and one of the major arguments, if you can put yourself back in that time, was, uh, you know, what is my what? Why do these Christians care so much about what I do? Right. How does how does my, who I'm in love with and who I commit myself to for life? Uh, how does that impact anyone else? Right. Yeah, what, what two people do in the privacy of their own home is nobody's business. That's what they used to always say. when I was exactly in high school. Exactly. That was that was always the. That was always the argument uh, that that they'd always come back. Oh, what's the big deal? How is this going to impact you? Just let it. Well, the reality is we now have you know about seven years uh, plus for the states that were were had same sex marriage before um, the Obergefell decision in 2015. But we've now had seven years of mandated same sex marriage uh, by the the U.S. Supreme Court in all 50 states, and. We have seen how it impacts all of us, right? Ask Jack Phillips, the the cake baker in Colorado. Ask Varonel Stutzman, who lost her flower shop in in Washington State, uh, how same sex marriage impacts them. Ask uh, Catholic charities uh, how same sex marriage has impacted them. Um, and you know, I, I was talking to one person in Washington about this uh, earlier today, trying to urge them to oppose this. And they were saying, well, one, they said, well, all it talks about is just marriage. So why, why are you talking about all these other things? And I said, listen, guys, that's, you, you're reading words on paper. That's not what the left does. You know, they take something like this and they use it as a bludgeon across the country. That's what the ACLU has been doing. That's what all of these folks have been doing is when you take a Burgerfell now and you say it's actually federal law. Uh, it, you know, that, that Congress has passed and signed by the president, that same sex marriage is the mandate. This is going to become the blunt force object that's being used to target Christians in the marketplace, uh, which, again, we'll talk about this whole capitalism conversation more, but target Christian ministries. You, you know, look, look back. If, if you don't believe me, uh, you've been hiding under a rock, but the real basic example, right? Uh, the Bostock decision. Uh, that we just got that Neil Gorsuch wrote a few years ago, right? The Bostock case was the case of, you know, men who wanted a cross-dress to work um, and 
Uh, they had been fired, uh, especially like the Harris funeral home case. They had been fired for, uh, for you know, wanting to dress like a woman and not file following the men's uh, dress code. Um, and Neil Gorsuch came out and said, "Nope, that's that's uh, unlawful discrimination under uh, uh, Title VII that says you cannot discriminate on the basis of sex uh, in employment." Uh, and, but he was really he was really adamant. I'm just talking about employment, just Title VII. I'm not talking about the rest of the law. We've got to, we're going to have to work out all these issues. Well, what has the Biden administration, every school board across the country done is they've taken that Bostock decision that was written explicitly to say this is only about employment in, in public businesses. Yeah, not uh, down here, though. They have taken this to say, nope, this means that men have to be allowed to compete in girl sports mm-hmm. and you bathrooms. have to allow men in bathrooms and locker rooms and all of that. that. That's what they do. And so to act like all we're doing again is, is codifying, uh, you know, the personal re- relationships between two people is just foolishness. Right. So second thing though, uh, that I, and this is kind of what our, our, our statement get was, was focusing on. Um, and it's, it, it, this is a much bigger conversation, right? This is this is a hard thing to wrap around in a in a public policy conversation, uh, in particular, and it's especially hard if you don't have a biblical worldview. But I, I think it's important at least for the church to get this um, as we engage uh, on this conversation. This was what actually our our statement was that we put out uh, condemning the vote out of the uh, the house, um, and, and it has to do with the fundamental question of why is government in the marriage business in the first place, right? Um, you know, and this gets back to the old arguments we used when we were debating this, um, you know, a decade ago. Um, the, 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 the question I always took it back to was why does government care about marriage, right? Real simply, why does government care about mine and my wife's relationship, um, but not mine and David's relationship? You know, believe it or not, for the crap I give David, I love. I'm gonna need David. you to. I'm gonna need you to clarify that last <laughs> statement. For for all the hard times I give David, <laughs> I love David. He is one of my favorite people in the world. I'm grateful grateful for him. Um, David and I are not going down to the courthouse anytime soon to get a buddy license, Man, right? I promise to God. <laughs> <laughs> right? No, but but we're you know, government doesn't care about our relationship, but for some reason, government cares about mine and Maria's relationship. I'm going to take a step further. You know, our, our, our great uh, operations director here, Robin, I love Robin. Robin is like an aunt to our kids. Right. Um, and we're Robin and I, man and woman, you know, but for some reason, government doesn't care about mine and Robin's relationship. It's a good point. Yeah. Right. It, 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 it just says, great, whatever, do you guys are friends. That's awesome. She loves your kids. I think she likes my, she certainly does like my kids a whole lot more than she likes me, but they don't, government doesn't care about our relationship. Why is that? That's because mine and Maria's relationship at least has the potential of doing something that none of these other relationships can. And that's creating children and then creating the most ideal environment for those children to be raised. Right. It, 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 that everything says, and this big Katie Faust stuff, you know, go, go read her then before us stuff, her book and, and all that they do, but, uh, or go read Brad Wilcox. The best place for a child to be on the whole is to be raised by the man and woman who created them, right? By their mom and dad. And so government recognized that that union and that stable environment is so important. We want to give tax incentives to it. That's all federal and state marriage policy is. It is it is tax incentives for you to do something that's good for society. Because what we've seen, what we've known forever, and what all the data shows is that when kids are raised in any other environment besides that relationship, that is besides the environment of both the, the man and woman that created them in a stable lifelong union, the cost to the state goes up dramatically. That's right. The odds of the kid ending up in prison, the odds of the kid uh, ending up uh, uh, in, in, on drugs, the odds of the kid ending up being in some situation that's going to make, require government to grow to care for them 
is increases dramatically. Now that obviously, does that mean that every kid ends up like that? Absolutely not. Does that mean that kids aren't being raised by great step parents or grandparents or foster parents or adoptive parents or single parents? Absolutely not. But we know that the best place for them is with their biological mom and dad. And, you know, this, our statement talked about, like, as we have a broken education system, you know, uh, unbelievable national debt, uh, ballooning prison populations, you know, all, all of these types of things. We reckon that it's all because children are being disconnected from their mom and dad in one form or another. And this is one more policy where we are, we're, we're undermining the very uh, purpose, the very structure and institution we have to incentivize that good home for children. The, the bottom line is government does not care, has, has no interest in two men or two women who are romantically attracted with one another and want to have sex together or, or live together or, or go to their religious institution and get what that religious institution calls a, a marriage license. They, government has, if, you, if they want to go do that, that's fine. Government doesn't care. Government has no interest in it. It doesn't do anything to, to, to benefit society uh, in that way. Uh, not at least not in the way that we're talking about um, or any significant way that even compares to what uh, a, a, a household of a married man and woman uh, can do and will do. Um, and so it's one of these things for these Republicans and these Democrats um, who I, I didn't put this in our statement last night, but I, I, I wrote it um, originally. How how hollow is it for these people to come out and say dads matter? Right. And talk about how important it is to have dads when they are creating and licensing and encouraging unions for children to be raised without their dad. You obviously don't think dads matter or you obviously don't think moms matter because we are now incentivizing unions um, that will fundamentally separate uh, children from their parents. That, that, that's the, the, this is a lot more than what two people do in the privacy of their home. It, it gets to that fundamental question. Um, the, the third thing I just want to touch on real quick uh, and final when, when we're talking about this is, you know, and Ryan T. Anderson uh, at the Ethics and Public Policy Center really ha has been all over this. But it was almost like a like a, 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 a starting gun going off as soon as a burger fell hit the transgender movement uh, was set off. Right. Mm -hmm. Because. You know, just like uh, just like I was saying that same sex marriage says moms and dads don't matter. Really, what same sex marriage says is that our bodies don't matter. Same sex marriage says uh, homosexuality says that men and women are interchangeable, right? That two men and two women are the same as a man and a woman. Um, and uh, you know, the, the the fundamental reality of what marriage is um, is. Uh, it is unimportant. Um, and you cannot separate what we're dealing with now with this conversation we're going to have with Dr. Van Mole, what we're talking about with Save Women's Sports, what we're talking about with uh, women's privacy and safety, and ignore the reality that when we created same-sex marriage nationwide, uh, we said that our bodies are are nothing, right? It's honestly, it's the same conversation that we're having with abortion, Right. What does abortion say? Abortion says our bodies, that there's no difference between our physical bodies and this desk that I'm sitting at, right? It's all just matter and we can call it and make it be whatever we want. Um, and, and that's the, again, it might seem broad and it might seem, well, how did you get there? Just look at what's happened over the last few years. It's not by accident. It, it's, it's a worldview. Carl Truman talks about this in, in his book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. You know, it, it's, it's that 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 disconnect from our 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 bodies and reality, um, and and as much as we want to, you know, fight uh, for the end of abortion, as much as we want to fight for the privacy and safety of women, you know, all of these issues. It's one of the reasons why at CCV we we change from Citizens for Community Values to Center for Christian Virtue is we don't want to look at these issues as social conservatives do, which is to say they're all individual standalone issues. There's abortion, there's gay marriage, there's religious freedom, there's transgenderism, there's school choice. They're all connected. 
And if you're not engaging on one of them and you let one of these pieces fall, they're necessarily going to come back for the rest. Um, and, and it's something yeah. that we as the body need to wrap our mind around. Yeah. And Aaron, I wanted to just say on that engagement piece, you know, I woke up this morning to a text from a pastor and, and I think there's, there's some confusion. One, um, this is not law yet, right? So it, it passed the house, it has some bipartisan support, but it still has to get 60 votes in the Senate. And, and I checked myself on that because, you know, we say it's got to get 60 votes, in it, but this thing didn't even have a committee. I mean, this, this thing didn't get vetted, uh, you know, by, by a committee first before it got to the floor uh for for the house vote but um typically this is what we this is how we we pass legislation um two um even though you know aaron you did a phenomenal job you know breaking down the details of the issue that's not what uh justice tom thomas did um he didn't go into any conclusions on same-sex marriage or anything. He just said, for the same reason why we had to send abortion back to the states, there's other issues that we, we where we have overstepped our bounds, um, uh, you know, and-, and, as, a and, court, and really, as a court, as a court, that's right. Yeah, yep. that's all he said is not not what he thought, but how this, this law, you know, was handled was improper. And there's some other laws that we've handled improperly. So, um, you know, there's just a lot of uh, things that folks just don't understand about this right now. No, Dave, I think that's an excellent point, especially because, you know, what and I, I even saw this yesterday, like there was a uh, uh, the Cleveland mayor uh, came out and said that they're not going to enforce Ohio's heartbeat law. And he said, oh, how terrible the court was to do this. And it's again, it's very clear he never read the decision. And it's very clear both all these people going after Justice Thomas for what he said, Um didn't read his uh, concurring opinion. Yeah, because Dobbs has nothing to do with this issue, by the way. Right. Just, well, yeah. the, the only thread that it has, the only thread, because again, if they if they had read Thomas's opinion, they would they would understand what he was saying, was that the 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 the, the similarities between Roe and Dobbs is that Roe created a constitutional mandate out of thin air, using you know using the substantive due process clause right. to find a right to abortion. That's that. Is, and what what Thomas was pointing at was that the court had time and time again uh, reached their reached the political ends they wanted to achieve by abusing this language in the in the Constitution. It's what yeah. we were. I, again, I was talking to a, a, another friend out of Washington today about this, and it, it's what we were what we've been saying for years about marriage, which is, you know, to suggest that. The Constitution requires same-sex marriage is nonsensical. Right. The, the Constitution doesn't say anything about marriage, right? There's, but the Constitution does not grant me and my wife the right to be married. It, it just doesn't talk about it. Does that make the Constitution evil? No. But it does say the, the pursuit of happiness, Aaron, and, and <laughs> my wife right. makes me very happy. There we and, go. Uh, you say, I don't well, know about your marriage, but <laughs> <laughs> listen. If we're taking that route, David, then I would not be doing this podcast with you because this just takes away my happiness every <laughs> once a week. You know, by co- it's it, it's unconstitutional for me to be on this podcast with you. We can have this discussion later. All right, <laughs> but but the, the idea that, that that the Constitution talks about marriage at all is is nonsensical. It's just not in there. And and all Thomas was saying was, listen, we this court has time and time again abused our power to, to achieve political ends uh, in these other and like we have in these other cases and at some point that he's saying at some point the court should go back and, and look at this issue um, and, and he's right. right about that yeah uh, again I still cannot get over you know more than 30 states passed these marriage amendments you had millions of voters come out and say we believe in marriage between one man and one woman and and five Supreme Court justices uh, went through and obliterated all of their votes. Um, it, it just, it's not how the system's supposed to work. So uh, we have gone way over on this topic. I told Dave, I warned him. I said, I got lots to say on this topic. Uh, and, and there's probably even more, uh, but we're going to take a quick break because we're going to bring in uh, Dr. Andre Von Mole. Again, if you uh, enjoy the pod, uh, please take this, uh, this short break uh, to, to leave us a review uh, leave a, leave a comment for us. Those things always encouraging, uh, remind David to go get a haircut. Uh, he's getting a little shaggy there. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, we'll be right back with, uh, Dr. Van Moore. Christian business owners today face more unique and challenging threats than ever before. 
As corporate America and chambers of commerce fall prey to woke capitalism, Christians in the marketplace need an advocate to protect their First Amendment freedoms. As Ohio's only Christian Chamber of Commerce, the Christian Business Partnership stands in the gap to advocate for, to educate, and to celebrate Christian business owners. Joining the partnership also allows businesses to provide their employees with health care insurance, workers' compensation, and exclusive banking and educational discounts. To find out more and to join, go to ccv.org slash cbp. That's ccv.org slash cbp. And welcome back to The Narrative. This is CCV President Aaron Bear with our co-host, David Mahan. I uh, have a very special guest here with us today as we continue this conversation around woke capitalism. Uh, a good friend who's come to Ohio before to uh, testify uh, on some CCV backed legislation, uh, Dr. Andre Von Moll. Uh, he is a, a physician out of, uh, the, out of California, out of the, uh, the, the Soviet Union of, uh, of California there. We won't hold that uh, against you, doctor. I know. <laughs> hey, you think it takes courage to do this work in, in Ohio, to do it in California? Uh, I, I cannot imagine. Um, but we were really interested to, to bring uh, Dr. Van Mol on to, uh, to talk particularly about how we're seeing uh, woke capitalism, really the, the politicalization of the marketplace, um, impact the medical industry. Um, and we're seeing that massively right now, especially with the transgender movement uh, and the transgender movement that uh, has, has impacted uh, children. Um, but this this has been Dave has been all over this issue for Dave. I'm going to turn it over to you. Let you dive in with with Dr. Van Mole. Doctor, it's, it's such a, a, a pleasure to see you again. Um, you know, our for the for the listeners, our relationship uh, kind of began when when we were dealing with the Safe Act, and um, I was looking for different resources uh, for for uh, different studies, what was going on internationally, standards of care. Uh, and I came across uh, Dr. Van Moe's work, and um, it's just phenomenal. The, the amount of um, research that you've done and, and just all of the, um, the citations and, and things were just amazing. And so, first of all, I just wanted another opportunity to thank you for that. But if you would, for our audience, just give everybody a, a little bit of a background of um, you know, what you've done in your career and what brought you to this very, what a lot of people would consider... Uh, it could be a little hairy to talk about these issues out in public. Yes. All right. Well, thanks again for having me. And uh, thank you for all those compliments. Yeah, I'm a board certified family physician. That's how I, I spend my days. You know, I, I work all day like everybody else. Um, I have had, you know, an interest in things, you know, bioethical and Christian apologetics since I was a teenager. It's been kind of a fire in my gut. <clears throat> and I've just kind of tried to keep up with things as, you know, as I've gone. But then certain things kind of thrust themselves into the forefront. And about five or so years ago for me, that was the whole transgenderism uh, issue and what's going on around that. Uh, so I found myself, you know, spending a lot of time, uh, you know, writing about it, reading up on it, um, advising, you know, legislatures on laws, um, working with teams. And man, the teams are great. I, I owe a lot to the teams I work with. Um, to uh, like, for example, working with Alliance Defending Freedom, <clears throat> generating amicus briefs for uh, high court and Supreme Court cases that deal with this and, you know, other things that we're interested in. Um, so trying to affect, you know, legislation, the high courts and the peer review literature, the idea being um, if you influence the idea makers, that carries out for three generations because they're the ones who set policy. It's important to inform the public uh, you know, uh, don't underestimate that. But for that, it needs to be done for every single generation. It doesn't really replicate itself. Whereas if you can influence the idea makers, you've got greater reach. Uh, and since all of our time is limited, you know, I, I try to invest mine where it'll do the most good. Right. You know, it, as, as qualified as you are, just on the woke capital, uh, capitalism side of this, um, you bring all of this wealth of knowledge, um, uh, and then when you stand up to testify at the SAFE Act, um, one in particular, but a couple of different representatives just wanted to discredit who you were, right? So all of these questions that we're talking about, is, is it okay to stop the naturally occurring puberty 
of a child, especially at the age of seven and eight years old, which in, you know, Cincinnati Children's Hospital admitted that, you know, they're, they're medicating kids as young as eight. Um, is it the cross-sex hormone? Should we be doing these things? What, what is the international standard of care? What have we seen for the last 20, 30 years happening in this area across the, the, net, the, the world? Instead of wanting answers to that, or addressing whether we are right or wrong on this issue, they just wanted to discredit you and, you know, Southern Poverty Law Center and all that. Speak to that a little bit. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, I think Margaret Thatcher hit on that, you know, and they, when they can't uh, address your ideas and the facts you're bringing, they go That's after right. you personally. So, you know, we're supposed to take that as a pat on the back and then don't take the bait uh, and, and just, you know, stick That's to good. what you need to be talking about, stick to the talking points. So Absolutely. I, I want to ask Dr. Van Mool, you know, when did this, when did this really start happening, right? When, when did you see the, the change in the industry and how did it, how did it really start showing up? When, when did, you know, cause, cause now it feels like you go into any children's hospital and this is front and center for a lot of them, right? It's, it's not yeah. this kind of side thing they do or undercover. It is like central to their mission, but, it, and that feels like it happened overnight. Um, when did yeah, you it does. Noticing now, it, all keep, that? keep in mind, this is the second time we've gone around this. I mean, uh, you know, uh, sex reassignment surgery and those kind of gender clinics, you know, were big in the late seventies, uh, early eighties. And uh, when Paul McHugh took over as uh, head of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins university, you know, their sex reassignment clinic came under uh, his headship and, you know, it was one of the foremost programs and he simply applied science to it. He told the people involved in it, you know, all that psychometric testing you do to see if somebody's a fit candidate for sex reassignment surgery, you're going to repeat those same tests down the road, which they hadn't been doing. And when they did, they found nothing was better. You know, none of the mental health problems, none of the issues improved. And they shut down the program. Paul McHugh had the program shut down saying this is unethical, you know, and immoral to um, be treating what's essentially a psychological problem uh, with, you know, irreversible surgeries and hormones that of course have a great deal of risks. Now we're 40 years later, we're making the same mistake, but now it's with kids. So just 15 years ago, there was right about one gender clinic in the US. And as of two years ago, I even lost count, you know, uh, it, it was over 65. But now Planned Parenthood is involved giving cross-sex hormones, you know, basically on a whim. I mean, we have evidence out of different states, advertisement Planned Parenthood puts out, you know, come see us, set you up in, in one appointment, which means it's absolutely impossible that the, you know, extensive uh, psychological evaluations that are supposed to be done, they claim are being done, you know, for kids that are being sent down the uh, transition pathway, it's impossible that those are happening for the kids, let alone for the family. And it's supposed to be happening for both. So it's the new cash cow for Planned Parenthood. You know, I mean, abortions are way down and uh, more than half of the abortions happening are, are now using the abortion pill. So, you know, Planned Parenthood feels itself being taken out of the, 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 the profit pail. And this is the new program. Uh, now, as for the actual gender clinics, you know, that are university affiliated, uh, I am told by several of my friends that are pediatric endocrinologists uh, working in academics as well, that now with this gender affirming therapy, pediatric endocrine clinics that used to always be running in the red are now running in the black. That's how much of a cash cow this is. Um, although they're also finding it increasingly hard uh, to get fellows to go into pediatric endocrinology is becoming less attractive for a few reasons here that are self-evident. I, I want to drill in on that a, a little bit, a little bit more, because, you know, I, I want to talk about, you, you talked about how it's now in the black. I want to talk about the economics of this. Um, because one thing that, that we've been big on is uh, you take a company like Advi uh, and the, their puberty blockers that they make where, you know, that was a drug that came out, you know, it's a few decades ago yeah, and was for a very rare disease. And uh, now all of a sudden it's, you know, blowing up. What, what, how much is that sort of profit motive driving some of this as well? Do you think? 
Well, this is really kind of straightforward to get people to understand. Uh, according to the American Psychiatric Association's DSM-5, you know, their Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, um, gender dysphoria for what they call, you know, natal females should be no more than three one thousandths of a percent in prevalence. And for natal males, no more than 15 one thousandths of a percent. So that's infinitesimal. But we have at least five surveys and studies in the past two years showing that now it's 2% of youth when interviewed, they say, yeah, you know, I could be trans. I mean, it's become, you know, a fad. Uh, kids want to belong and this seems to be the belong cause. And there's even some surveys out in the past year that I, I don't put any stock in because it's like, oh, how did you ask this question to whom? Uh, but in that one, it was 30% of the kids interviewed said, yeah, I could be trans, but let's just stick with the 2%. That's almost a thousand fold increase. So that's what you've done with your margin of profit, leveraging this up from, you know, thousands of a percent to two or three percent. And mind you, when you've medicalized someone for a mental health issue, you've medicalized them for life. They're going to need those puberty blockers followed by cross sex hormones and those cross sex hormones they need to take forever. You're fighting your biology. Your sex is stamped on every nucleated cell in your body. You know, every cell in your body with the nucleus tells you what sex you're supposed to be. So you're on those cross sex hormones. Think of them as wrong sex hormones forever. And whatever complications they generate, that's more medical dollars. And if you stumbled into the, you know, gender affirming su surgery, the sex reassignment surgery, uh, that's going to cost and whatever complications from it are going to cost too. So you're taking someone that you would have had very little medical profit from, certainly if you just you know, treated them, you know, psychologically, psychiatrically, and you've turned it into a cash cow that uh, profits the hospitals, the pharmaceutical firms, you know, any biotech company that can come up with some widget that plays into this game can profit off of it. Uh, insurance companies are paying for it, you know, under the gun, under pressure, um, and so on and so forth. And of course, you know, these huge philanthropic organizations um, that are helping drive this too, because it's, it's even more ideologic than it is woke capitalism. I mean, woke capitalism is just, you know, seedy profiteering from it. Um, whereas the ideology is just driving this thing like a religion. And, right. you know, when you disagree with these peeps, you know, as I'm doing right now in a couple of states, they do not take it well. But it's, yeah. it's interesting, you know, that the retorts they give us and the accusations are almost carbon copy the same from one group and another, which Let's makes it relatively easy to knock down. Let's hone in on that, Doc. I, I, I remember, okay, so we're sitting in the hearing and you have, I don't know, Chloe, you know, Chloe, yeah. um, uh, she's a, uh, a young girl, uh, thought that, that she might be trans or whatever, 12, 13 years old. They put her on puberty blockers at 13, you know, increase her on up to, to cross-sex hormones before 14, 15, she has a double mastectomy. Yeah. Now, as a father, right? Most people aren't listening to this podcast, aren't in policy, they're not, you know, physicians. They're just listening to this, like, what in the world is going on? You look at a kid like Chloe, and then at 16, a year after having a double mastectomy, she looks in the mirror, always having wanted to have children. Now she says, I cannot breastfeed my child. It just hit yeah. her, right? That You talk about social contagion and trends. That's how fast this is happening. This little girl didn't realize that the surgery she's about to have at, at 15 years old is going to inhibit her from doing something she's always wanted to do in terms of motherhood. This yeah, is where we get are. it back. And, and then you listen to testimony from Children's Hospital that tells us, well, you know, uh, how how quickly from the time that a kid like Chloe comes to the, the clinic to when she is medicalized. And they're saying on average about four months and four months is all it takes to deal with all the com comorbidities, the, the adverse childhood experiences. I would have to imagine that, that there's other people that's looking at Chloe and other people like Chloe um, and saying, this is a conscious issue. I cannot stop this child's, you know, naturally occurring puberty. I cannot give her, you know, I cannot start doping her on tea, uh, like we say in the sports world. Um, what happens to those individuals? 
Uh, well, you know, for example, as I told the Ohio legislature when I was there, uh, when that uh, one legislator was pinging on me, you know, this is why you don't get more people testifying against us. There's no witness protection program. We genuinely risk losing our jobs and therefore our careers uh, and potentially our personal safety and that of our family. You know, the, the intimidation factor is huge. Um, it, and it's quite easy to drum somebody out of their job. There's all kinds of ways to do it, right? And as for, you know, concerned parents and even concerned Chloe's, we hear reports all over the country and all over the world that, you know, when, when you come with misgivings and complaints, you're just kind of given the, oh, you know, that's part of it. Everybody feels that it'll be fine. And it's like, well, no, it's not going to be fine, you know, um, plus reckless stuff like Johanna Olson Kennedy out of Children's Hospital Los Angeles, you know, an article um, that she published on what they're doing there shows, you know, mastectomies down to 13 years of age. It's like, wow. are you kidding me? Plus, wow. uh, you know, a comment of hers when she was asked about it is, oh, you know, if they change their mind, they can always get breasts later. No, you can't. You can get implants, right. but the breasts are gone. Yeah. So. Dr. Vermeule, this is probably uh, unquantifiable. There's, there's probably no way of putting a number to this, but how, how deep, when you look around at your colleagues, whether in California, across the country or the industry, how much of this do you feel like is being driven by the true believers? Um, and how much of it is, uh, what percentage of docs do you think are probably just too scared to say anything today? I think too scared is pretty big. Plus, you know, there's relatively few doctors that are in, you know, a field or a specialty that are really going to be coming up to contribute much to this. You know what I mean? There's I know, only so many specialties that are in a position to give puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones. Um, but, uh, you know, when you talk about, oh, there's all those medical organizations, you know, and they represent hundreds of thousands of doctors and psychologists. No, hard stop. You know, when those organizations come out in favor, it's a handful, it's a couple, you know, it's a few dozen, maybe maximally 30 people in the case of like the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, or pediatricians, I should say, uh, who, who come up with these policies and generally you look at who's writing them and, and the road pretty quickly leads to WPATH, which is not a scientific organization, not a medical one, it's an advocacy group. Um, so, you know, be it the psychological organizations, the psychiatric, the medical ones, it's, it's just this small cater of, of their leadership, you know, again, a few dozen uh, that make the policies and generally the rank and file never get a vote, but they kind of know to keep their mouth shut if they know what's good for them, at least don't be too loud about it. Because again, um, you can be you know, put in the hurt locker really quickly between the activists and uh, the, the advocates in your own organization. You know, the, you know, just listening to you um, speak, Doctor, they, I, I was preaching this weekend, had an opportunity to, to present before a lot of pastors here, uh, pastors from all over the world, actually, but they, they gathered here in, in the Pickerington area. And, um, you know, the, the subject was, if, if the foundations be destroyed, what will the righteous do? That word foundations means social order. <clears throat> yeah. And, and when I hear you talk about, you know, endocrinologists <clears throat> and therapists who, are, are being pressured to say this and do this, and it's unethical, and it's going against their conscience. They are leaving. You know, I, just this weekend, I, I was doing some research, and, you know, teachers, they can't find substitute teachers. They can't find bus drivers. They're, you know, we've got 60-some uh, thousand law for, or, uh, you know, soldiers that, that are about to be laid off, and, you know, doctors, because they don't want to give you know, some man who now thinks he's a woman, a hysterectomy, he's being sued. And, you know, it's like, you know, when we look at these scriptures, how in the world, th there's a passage in Isaiah 3, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but it, it does say that one of the way that, that we are judged as a people when we enter into rebellion is that God removes our leaders. God removes, it says, both supply and support in Isaiah 3, the mighty man, the warrior, the judge, the prophet, the, the, the great orator, the elder, or the wise. He starts taking all these out. Now, it doesn't say how he takes it out, but as I listen to all this woke stuff, that's what I'm seeing happening in real time. And then it gets all the way down to the bottom, and it says that once they've destroyed you know, society to the point where, you know, it's not even about philosophical ideas anymore. It's, it's about, man, there's nothing to eat. Mm -hmm. um, it, it gets down to where one brother who's living and sleeping on his daddy's couch reaches out to his brother and says, hey, 
you've got dignity, you've got honor, you've got degrees and knowledge and wisdom, save us. And he says, I don't have anything either. One of the things I love and appreciate about you is that you have put your neck on the line to have an answer. And you were going to risk your livelihood. You went to school for this. You spent year, your whole life getting to the point where you are to have dignity and honor in whatever area where you work and serve. And, uh, and you're putting all that on the line to stand for truth and to rebuild society and bring common sense. And I just want to stop and thank you for that, because this is thank you. this is a much bigger issue than just one trans or medical field. It's much larger than that. Yeah. Yep, good time for a reformation. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'd say so. Well, I, I, but but that is a yeah. You know, again, I think this is the the commonality, I, Dr. Van Mol, I think I think that's a a point well taken. That there is a significant difference in a lot of what we see in corporate America to what we're seeing in the medical industry, where there a lot of what's happening in corporate America. It feels like a lot of the top people. Um, are getting bullied or about right they're mm -hmm. they're they're trying to do you know whatever they can to keep the 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 wokesters if you will the left off their back and so they'll all right we'll sponsor this all right we'll make the pride you know logo all of that um and it, don't get me wrong there are the, those true believers out there just go watch the disney videos to to see that um but but the medical industry there there does seem to be um, a lot more of a uh, sort of whole cloth, uh, you know, not, not just acceptance, but pushing um, of this, you know, for, for your average parent, especially um, that's, that's listening to this um, who, again, I still got to, I, I got two young kids. I still got to take my kids to the pediatrician. Um, what, how do you recommend to parents to be, you know, it's, just a wise consumer uh, as they're going to the doctor today. Yeah. Well, know the people you're going to. And if you don't have that option, you know, because of the circumstances, uh, I'd advise being there with your kid the whole time. And if that's prevented, you know, because it's in, in the pediatrician's training and the family physician's training, you know, at some point, you know, supposed to separate the parents and kids, you know, to look for abuse and stuff like that. But that's the opportunity for a gender whisper and, you know, right on down to get access to your kids. And, Kids don't have any means to fight that oh, off. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Did, did you just say gender whisperer? Gender whisperers, yes. <laughs> I've never heard, never and, heard know, that before. Again, the, the deal, you know, the opposition to what's happening to kids here, <clears throat> you know, in my case, you know, I'm, I'm a religious conservative, you know, uh, I'm a political conservative, but it's a hands across the aisle deal. I mean, it is people of all political parties, it, it, you know, it, it, it's conservative, it's liberal, it's religious, it's not religious. Uh, we, we even have, uh, you know, no kidding, um, you know, gay group, gay identified groups and one trans identified adult group who work with us because they all agree. No, draw the line at kids. There's nothing in this that should be, you know, That's something right. that you approach kids with. So it's not, you know, just the, the radical right, you know, as they want to see on the other side. It's an all hands on deck because of how serious this is. Um, you know, fantastic, you know, um, interview I read with you know, the, the guy who heads the GLB Alliance in the UK. Uh, formerly it was Stonewall and it split over this very issue a couple of years ago. And the guy who heads up the GLB side uh, in this interview says, you know, there shouldn't be gender stuff in schools. In fact, there shouldn't be sexuality stuff in schools because kids don't have any way of handling it. You know, they have no grid. They're, they're uh, too vulnerable and that it sets them up for predators to show up because predators go wherever the prey is, you know? Uh, and he points out that's, that's true in youth groups and churches. It's true in the city park. It's true in Little League. It's true in Scouts. Of course, it's going to be true with the GLBT clubs at school. So th there's things to look out for, you know, and our disagreement makes nobody a hater, a bigot or a phobe. You know, I resent each of those terms. They don't apply. Uh, we're just talking about the safety of kids, everybody's kids, adults. You know, when you're an adult, you get to make your own bad decisions, <laughs> you know, preferably you'd be making good ones. But uh, we very much have to hold the line, you know, where it comes to protecting kids. So to speak to kind of who, what the pressure that these hospitals are under, you know, you, you kind of gave me a little primer on the human rights campaign and how yeah. they have a certain rating 
uh, right. for even even the medical community. I can understand maybe with businesses and things like that, but but the medical healthcare system. Yeah, they have a business one. They have a um, a government one, um, and you know, in, in, intended like for you know communities, counties, cities, stuff like that. And they have a medical one that apparently rate like seventeen hundred different clinics and hospitals. And so, it so would, first of all, who, yeah. who is the human rights campaign? Human rights then, campaign is the yeah. biggest, you know, uh, GLBT advocacy group in the country. So okay. loads of money. And so, um, and, and the hospitals, you know, everyone falls over themselves to get the high rating because otherwise you look bad and that carries over to other rating systems like U.S. News and World Report and stuff like that. But it, it just looks so, it's such a conflict of interest to me. It's so corrupt, you know, because people have looked into it it's like, well, how do you get the rating? Well, you invite them in and they invite you to donate to them. Okay, so now you're giving money to the group that's going to rate you. And they want you to withdraw support from conservative and religious stuff because that's hurt, that hurts GLBT people. And it's like, are you kidding me? Uh, you know, and the religious hospital chains are, are part of this and brag about their high ratings. You know, it's like, uh, th- this is corrupt. This needs to be exposed. This is, this is a game. It's a scam. Right. So you're getting, you're paying them to give you a, a high woke rating. And you're doing stuff that gets you that high woke rating, you know, so it affects your employment policy and a bunch of other stuff. And it's like, you know, this just isn't it. You, you do a whole lot better just to say, well, here's the rules in this company and this school and this hospital. Everybody treats everybody else with respect, period. But that's, you know, that's too straightforward and there's no totem pole to that. Right. And, and when you're protecting groups, whatever the identity group is, that means the individual doesn't mean anything anymore. And constitutionally, that's pretty hazardous. Yeah. So, Dr. Van Mull, as we start to wind down here, you know, big picture, we talked about what should wise parents and consumers be doing. What, what can we as a, you know, we're, we're doing things like the SAFE Act here in Ohio. Yeah. What do you think are, are some of the the uh, the, the things that can happen long-term to turn this back. I, I, I know, again, I, I think about, you know, one, one physician in particular, I talked to about this probably four or five years ago. And the thing that he was just blown away by was, you know, he, he was a surgeon and he said, we, we wouldn't change, you know, the, the smallest, you know, uh, insertion, you know, like, like yeah. the, the smallest, you know, scalpel, te- Decisions. scalpel technique, mm-hmm. Uh, without years of research and arguing it over, arguing over it in papers and all this kind of stuff. And overnight it was, yep, you need to start doing gender transition on kids. And if you don't, you're a bigot and you don't believe in science. Um, what, what are the opportunities that all of this kind of creates for us to be able to push back and, and turn this back culturally, societally, those types of things? Yeah, by, by openly questioning You know, uh, again, for parents, make sure your kids hear about things from you first. That law first mention uh, weighs a lot because your kids will compare everything to what they heard first about something. So the law first mention. Uh, Secondly, you find out what's going on in your school. You know, the principals, the teachers and whatnot, whatnot. Let your voice, you know, be heard. I mean, be polite, be honoring, but be there. Um, And in terms of what really turns this around, uh, Professor Paul McHugh, Johns Hopkins University, brought out of retirement to head up their McHugh Center on Human Flourishing, I believe it's called. Uh, he says this comes down with the malpractice cases, not just going after uh, the doctors and the hospitals, but the insurance companies that fund this, the pharmaceutical firms, the biotech firms, the philanthropy groups that make this possible. As soon as it's plainly evident that this isn't a cash cow anymore, but that you know the doctors and hospitals and companies that participate in this, they're at risk. Watch how fast this comes down. And when the fad stops being gender transition and starts being malpractice cases for the butchery that was done to kids, things will change quick. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Dr. Andre Van Mol, thank you so much for for taking the time to, thank to you. be with us, sir. Grateful for you, uh, and uh, and grateful for everyone for listening to this conversation. Uh, if if you are in Ohio and you want to help uh, support the Safe Act, that's House Bill four fifty four. You can go to ccb.org, uh, go to our action center, and and you can send a, an email to your lawmaker through our website uh, to tell them to pass that bill. 
Uh, I know multiple other states are, are considering similar legislation. Uh, get involved with that uh, by all means. Uh, and thanks for listening to the narrative. Again, uh, be sure to leave us a, a review and a, a five-star rating uh, where, wherever you get your podcast. And we'll be here uh, back next week. <laughs>